to start. I would like to thank you that you make the trouble to come over lunch and listen to uh, a historic lecture. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that I am very happy to come to Ort because I worked for Ort as the vice president of Ort in Germany for many years. And I also had many students from Ort Montevideo in Dessau. And um, so it is somehow coming to a place which you know, even if I never spoke here. This lecture is a series of lectures about the European city. Now, my idea of what cities in Europe is, this idea is that I believe it is not the nations of Europe that make Europe, but the cities. The cities are in their plurality, there is many of them, they have certain characteristics, they have certain histories, and the cities were the place of the intellectual elite of a place, and they developed new ideas. So this book that I printed on European cities starts with Athens, with Rome, <coughs> with the places for the cathedrals, like Reims, <coughs> Strasbourg, other cities, you know. And each time I'm trying to find out what was it? What was the invention, but what was the idea of the people in the city that made the city the way it is? Now, of course, you know, since I have to go to lunch afterwards and uh, I can't tell you uh, this whole sort of story that is like a 2,000 year story. But what I want to do with this special lecture here, uh, and you can see 1850 to 1930 in 45 minutes, I mean, that's not so easy. But I want to point at some very special thing that is to do with Paris in the 19th century. Yes, we all know, because we read in the newspaper that the, the cathedral of, of Notre Dame just burned <laughs> down. You know. There is, of course, what they call the Ile de France, that little bit where that cathedral is standing that is the birthplace of France, you can say. Yes? I'm not going to especially talk about this very ancient time. Now, Paris is a seat of this idea of thinking about city elites. Yes? They, they really managed to develop many ideas in that city that was relevant for the whole of Europe. Now, the lecture that I have prepared here deals with, at first, the idea of composition. I had the good luck, when I was in Zurich, in Zurigo, to learn with an Italian professor called Kamenzind. And Alberto Kamenzind, apart from being a wonderful person, he had, he said to us, you know what, it's very strange, but we in Italians, we invented Renaissance, and Renaissance is like the way we eat. <laughs> it's funny. So he said, yeah, we make everything to perfection. Each element, we make it to perfection. Like, you, and, and we have, 500 different pasta, each one very different, but it's pasta, but it's made to perfection in each, in every way. The French, 
We sent them, that's what he said, we sent them the Medicis. She became the wife of the French king. She brought her cooks. The French had another idea. They composed food. They took individual pieces that you eat and combined them with a sauce and make a composition. That's what we didn't do, he said, in Italy. We looked at the individual elements. Now, if you start thinking about composition in that way, then I would um, I would like to begin, if, if this thing will help me, yes, to show you someone who was very much the, at, the, at the beginning of this idea of elements that make up space as a composition of elements. This is the architect Durand, Jean-Nicolas Durand. He was teaching in the Ecole Polytechnique. No, it's not called like that. Ecole de Pont et Chaussée, the school of roads and bridges, which was started directly after the French Revolution in Paris. And you see that even though he shows you facades that, yes, you know them, they're somehow they survived to our day. But he was not interested in the facade. He was interested how to make that thing, how to compose it, and which elements to use. So he introduced something that we all use today, which is new. It's the grid. He invented a constructive grid. Basically, this guy was an engineer more than let's say, a sort of aesthetic architect. And he makes, he makes variations what you could do on this grid using a language that we know. This is a sort of Palladian villa. You know, we know this thing from Renaissance. But he starts to make compositions made out of spatial elements. And this is one of the bases of the most known school in Paris, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which in the late 1800s becomes really the kind of argument, <laughs> the seat of an argument, you could say. Because they had something which is called the Prix de Rome, the Rome Prize. And that was usually something where you had to compose something compose as spatial elements, put together spaces, and, make, and they had to be symmetrical, and so on. And it was, it was this school that had this belief of composition. Now, it greatly influenced the school in the early 20th century still, greatly influenced American architects, because there were some Americans that went then and made, let's say, the Chicago exhibition in 1901, I think it was. Um, you know, they believed in this way of composing space according to this Beaux-Arts tradition. Now, alongside that, however, there was this second element also present in Paris at the same time, which was based on construction. This idea of the grid and using new materials, and employing elements in that way. Now, I'll come to that. One of the main Beaux-Arts buildings, I think, that Paris has is the opera. The opera was built by um, Auguste, what's his name? Garnier, Tony Garnier. This is Tony Garnier, who was then sent around the country to to build like the Hotel uh, Paris in Monte Carlo and other things. You know, he had really a kind of feeling for making grandiose designs. And this is this house. And um, it, you have to understand it comes, the first opera house at all was built in Vienna. And it was also a sort of classicist building, but this is of course very opulent. And the idea of this building is, I think, also something about how can we provide an elegant ambiance for the people to meet. And you will see that, interestingly, in the ground plan of this, the actual opera space is rather small, which is interesting. 
I mean, a building that, you know, form follows function. No. Form follows social event in this case. This is what I'm trying to show. So you have this grandiose building, the opera, and you have, you can see, the, the, symmetrical, the symmetrical setup and the adding of individual volumes to make up this composition of the opera. And you also see that the actual opera space is not very big. Here you are. But what is very big is this. And all of this is just to have an elegant evening in Paris. And opposed to what you could call the city of pleasure, Vienna, yes? Um, you can say that this is really interesting because in the city of pleasure in Vienna, the theater and the opera were much more important than the news of politics in the newspaper in the morning. People would like to find out what has been played in Vienna in the opera house. And they, of course, have an immense tradition of people, Beethoven, Brahms, Mahler, Schubert, and so on. I mean, they were the world city of classical of music. Strauss, the first inventors with the waltzer of pop music, you could say, in the 19th century. The music for everybody, where you would not have to have such a billing to go and listen to it. So looking at it from a social aspect, the interior of the opera is really interesting because that is the main space. You come, you meet, you show off your nice dress. That's what you do in Paris opera. In Vienna, it was different. And in Vienna, it was also tragic because the architects of the Viennese opera house committed suicide. That tells you also something about culture and the importance of culture. And I said they killed themselves because there was such a critique. It was the first building type as opera house, there wasn't such a thing before. So they built this, and, and, the, and the press killed it. They said, that's a horrible building. Well, stupid, you know. They had some, and it really, they, they, one of them, I think, von Sickard's book, killed himself. Anyway, this is not a place to kill yourself. This is a place to have a great time, this Paris opera house. And I'm try, I was trying to show by the plan you know, this idea of how to compose space. You, you just take elements of space. You have, you have constructive elements, like pillars. And then you have a space within another space, and so on. It, you know, it, I hope I can bring across this, this idea of what Durand started as a thinking process, and what Garnier then translated into something that was for the greater, better bourgeois, society after 1850. Um, and let's go as next to another building. This is the Temple of Knowledge, yes? This is the National Library um, by Violet Le Duc. And he used other things. He was much more interested in construction, in new material, using uh, using steel or some, I don't know how you call that, you know, that stuff that we had before, hard steel. Um, and that was, of course, on the outside, it behaved like you have to have behave in Paris. You have a classical building, and then the inside is suddenly totally a revolution, you know, to, to make this construction. That was really something new. And the interesting thing with this, of course, is that this is what happened if you take building types, and we were just talking about the opera as a new invention, a temple for music. If you take that to your railway stations, I don't know how it is here in Montevideo. I haven't been to the railway station. Maybe, you know, if it came from this time, then railway stations, especially in England, you know, go to Paddington Station, you go to King's Cross, they all have an outside which is more or less classical like this, using classical language. Then you go inside, and the engineers were the ones 
to make the new stuff. They, you know, they were the, the, the sort of, they represent more the change of times than these. What I also want to show is that, of course, Paris was a home of what Gottfried Semper described as the century of styles. There was this man, you know, uh, there was an article, not by Semper, who, which, um, which put this question, in which style should we build in 1850s? Because they thought, you know, a house of justice has to be in the Greek style. They are the inventors of democracy. We have to make it in a Greek style with the Greek columns and so on. When you go out from the lecture hall, you see here examples of the five orders of Greek columns and so on. It was, you know, of course you had to learn that in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts too. Now this is an international exhibition, I think around 1870. And you see the collection of the styles of individual countries. This Paris got completely rid of in the 30s. And they did this, the Palais de, what's that called? I forget what it's called, I'd have to look up. But it's, it's, in, it's that same place. And it was, this it was an exhibition in 1936 where um, alongside America, Nazi Germany showed its nationalist architecture, for instance, and so on. It was the last, it was the last international exhibition, world, as you called them at the time, world exhibition. Today we call it Expo, so maybe you know what I'm sort of talking about, that took place there. And it was made in a sort of bombastic, uh, almost Art Deco style that replaced this image that I showed before. And it also banned the individual exposure of individual countries into the house. Today, it's an interesting place. You can, you can go there. It has wonderful big models of all the cathedrals of some of Le Corbusier's Unité and so on. One to one, you can go inside. It's pretty impressive. So it's like a musée for the art decoratif. Now, this, again, art or this idea of composition had, of course, something to do with ornament. And in that connection, if you listen or read Adolf Loos, that ornament is a crime. Um, we would have to be all put in prison if that was true. But in that vein, you could understand that, of course, the architecture of, of the Beaux-Arts was something that had to do with existing or getting big after the revolution and the restoration. If you know, French history a little bit, then you know that Napoleon came, he made this war in all of Europe, he was sent to Hans St. Helena finally, and in Vienna in 1815, there was a Congress, the Vienna Congress, which determined to completely newly divide up Europe, there were new countries coming, and it was a time of restitution. The revolution was finished, People were you know, happy to get rid of this guy who was making all the time only trouble and war, to look at it in this sort of restorative way. And they felt, ah, now, the bourgeoisie, finally, we have something to say. Now, in 1848, 30 years, let's say almost, after, or 20, 30, oh, yeah, 30 years after Napoleon's demise, you had again a revolution, and this is what's showing here. The first commune, 1848, was of course also the year where Karl Marx published his Communist Manifesto. It was a year where you had revolutions all over Europe, including in Germany. You know, people were standing up and they were saying, well, this whole aristocracy and we never get anything and we are being put down and we want to have our own rights. They rose up. This is the French, this is the commune 
of Paris and you can see that one of the things what made their revolution, their protest so successful in some way, it was beaten down, there were many people killed, but what was difficult was the infrastructure and the ground plan of the city of Paris being connected with these small streets so you could make barricades and so on. And what this shows here is how then afterwards a man called Baron Haussmann, and those of you who have been to Paris know that there is a boulevard Haussmann, completely changed the structure of the city. And here you have Haussmann, <laughs> and this guy, he is a house owner, one of those you know, bourgeois guys with a little bit of money, and he says, ah, very well, they're taking another house down. I get a better view, I'm going to raise the rent. That's this, this caricature. And then what you see what he did, he overlaid, this is, you know, this small stuff is the kind of, um, let's say, infrastructure or the small grain of the city. And he came and out of military reasons, so that the military could just march down those avenues and go into the side streets and defend, in that term, the monarchy, yeah? Napoleon III. So, and then you see here what they did. Yeah? On the right, you see the oldest Paris church, Saint-Germain-des-Prés. It, this is an illustration of 1868, and they're taking down parts of the city, like I showed before in, in this image. I mean, what you see afterwards is, you know, how do, how do you, what do you, they just took it off. And then you have, in 1889, the first Parisian World Exhibition. And this is a perspective of the city where you can see these new avenues going all to the Arc de Triomphe here. They all, you know, all the directions end up here. And it would be interesting, and we had him as a guest uh, in Dessau, two years ago, there is a man called Andrei Vodichko, who is Polish, who made, out of the Arc de Triomphe, he completely converted. He said, this is not a peaceful monument at all. It's a monument of war. And he made a whole book, interesting, how you know, it is, in the end, something to do with militarism and war, this thing, even though it's the seat of the unknown soldier. Anyway, of course, Paris and the Ile de France is this. That's it. That's where you have uh, Notre Dame. That's Ile de France. That was the nucleus of Paris. And again, I'm, I'm trying to show you know, these vistas. You're looking from the Louvre to the Place de la Concorde. And you, know, you have all these new things like this, of course. It's the victory of steel and industrialization because it's a completely useless building in a way. I mean, if you really think about it, what do you do with this? But everybody, if you ask somebody, and I'm sure you will find yourself doing that, can you tell me one building that you know in Paris? People will say, yeah, this one. Because it sort of, it became a real icon. Now, Another thing that was changed was how to control how people live together in Paris. And this houseman did by, you know, these are the typical houses of Paris. And how do they work? This is something you find all over along these boulevards. It's a kind of type model. And if you look, this is quite a nice caricature. You can see that on the bottom floor lives the concierge. He will control everybody that goes in and out. He goes on everybody's nerves, right? But he has also a good time because he doesn't have to work hard. That's according to this. Then you come to the first floor. In the first floor, 
these people, they are, you know, this is probably at two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm done, you know, I'm wealthy, I'm having a good time. And of course, he has the bel etage, the nice floor, the very high. And they go up one, and this is the middle classes, they're doing okay. If you go up one more floor, it starts to be a problem because here comes this guy who says, listen, you owe us money, you better pay, here is my bill. And they have, you know, they're poor, they have kids and so on, and it's not easy. And then here you have the, you know, the painters and all the kind of artists with no money at all. If you look at, um, there are some nice operas that we'll talk about that, La Bohème. It's the Bohemians, right? And uh, you can see, I mean, that the roof isn't so well done, so they have to have an umbrella not to get wet. And finally, you have the cat on the deck, on, on the top of, top of the roof. So what does this show? It shows, in a way, that uh, these buildings were kind of social pyramids, again. They were a complete um, photo, let's say, of the structure of the society at that time. And until today, I mean, it is like that, except that they put a lift so that even at the top, you can ask for a decent price for the apartment because to go up five floors wasn't so easy. And uh, it has changed. These houses have become a matter of speculation in Paris. They're very expensive to, to buy apartments. They're very, very expensive. But um, at that time, it shows you it was also a method of controlling the people. You know, that the that the one strata of society lived together with the very poor, but it also controlled them. Who's going in, who's coming out, what's going on in our building, it was all that. And here are some examples for how to furnish your apartments in the late 19th century. This is um, from a book of 1869 by Bruce Talbot, and is How to Make a Living Room. And on the bottom, you have, a, you have Edward Goodwin, uh, who was representing his um, living room in 1877 in William Watt's uh, catalog. And this William Watt was selling, was selling the furniture. So it was like, you know, if, if you want to live correct, this is better what you do. So all I'm trying to show is that up to this time, end of 19th century, Paris was a place that kind of was a model place at one on one hand <laughs> for the wealthy bourgeois upper class. They kind of developed something in that city for that. And then they had other things like the Boulevard Temple. They had what Walter Benjamin later described as the flaneur, the man who goes through the city and he takes a stroll, and he has time, and he looks at it, and he writes about it, and he understands it. <coughs> or you have the Parc Monceau to have contact to the nature, and people would go there on outings. Then these, in the, those things that really changed the city in scale of building, one, you have here the Alles Les Alles, which they took down, I think, in the 70s or something, and put some horrible stuff, and now they're putting them back originally. This was, of course, the food exchange. A huge city, one million people. How, you know, how do you bring to feed the city? You need something like that. It's just an exchange. It's not, it's not a stock exchange, a food exchange. And then I talked already about the Eiffel Tower and what it also created. I mean. The Eiffel Tower isn't just one piece, but all of this invalid and so on. Come, I mean, the invalid is earlier, but you know, the, the park and so on, that all comes with it as a package, you could say. <laughs> and what I want to do in this last part is to show how these things changed. And this is also interesting about Paris, because Paris was a hotbed for people that were not French to come there and formulate new ideas in architecture. You have 
Futurismo. Uh, you have people like Mario Chiatone um, or um, Sant'Elia. I don't know if you know who they were. I'm going to show some of their work. And they believed in two very Italian things, noise and movement. And apart from that, in war, this was a rather unfortunate bit of their belief that they, they really, you know, because they loved the machine, they loved kinetic movement. This, I think, is important to understand. And they made a futurist manifesto, and here are some of the famous drawings that I'm, I'm going to show, Santelia and others, how they imagined that new machines, like cars, like railways, they didn't have, at the time, there was no flight, I mean, there was no airplanes, but these new me means of movement, how they would come and change the city. They were the first ones to develop real futuristic ideas about that. And here is Marinetti, and of course he had a car, obviously he had to have a car, in Paris, he was the one who made the manifesto. At the same time, you have the ideas of Dada, Dadaism. Do you, does that say anything to you? Dadaism is a sort of movement that is against everything. And it's a cacophonia of all the things in the world that are in disorder. And it loves this disorder. It talks about this disorder. And you have here, look what they write, Guerre, yeah? Guerra. <coughs> The Prussians, I understand that connection very well. And then you have tum tum, you have you know, things like this. You, know, you have all this stuff, you have, you have the mathematics and verbalization dynamic de la route. So this kind of noise, and then you have Balla, who makes these paintings, and is trying to show the motion of a dog. You have, at the same time, in America, of course, you have the first photo analysis of movement of people. You have films that show people riding a horse, people running, people working at a place. But the ideas are completely different. The American ideas was to, to optimize the work situation because they had invented, you know, the, the sort of, how do you call that? Um, the production line, production line uh, making, yeah. And um, these guys were, however, more fascinated by the idea of movement in itself. So you have this painting, or you have those of birds flying, or, you know, and, and then the same thing about power, a power station, electricity, a new, a new element. And uh, this is Antonio Santelia, who unfortunately got killed in the First World War as a very young man in 1916. He made drawings that are really kind of utopian, you could see. But in somehow, they were kind of looking into the future in a very realistic way. Another power station. If you look at Erich Mendelssohn's drawings, you can see also the parallelity of it. And here we come, you have a railway station. You have a railway station that is interlocking with other things, with other ways of moving, using a car, being a pedestrian, going in a bus. I mean, this is interesting because the modern airports all do this. They're a place where you have buses, cars, trams, <laughs> trains, Airport, uh, airplanes are meeting in one spot, kind of interlocking the idea of movement in a modern city. And that, you could say, it could be a railway station, could be an airport, you don't know, right? And some more of this, Chiatone, who also showed that. Down here you have the train, then you've got people moving, but it's a kind of new architecture, a vivid architecture in a new futurist city. That's the hotel. And you can see also influences like, you know, Manhattan and so on. Obviously, they had been there and they had seen that and they made their new own version of that. I'm just 
to going through this because they are obvious what they are. That's the interlocking of all these modern things. Now this is Auguste Perret, the um, teacher of Le Corbusier, or teacher, I can't say, but he worked with him uh, in, his, um, in his studio, and he was one of the co-authors of the first concrete building ever in Rue Franklin, number 13 in Paris. This is Corbusier, and here is this Rue Franklin, Auguste Gustave Perret, it's uh, 1904 to 5, it uses cast concrete, totally new material. Again, and you have Henri Sauvage. If you looked at the Chiatone drawings, at the Saint Elia drawings, this staggering of uh, etage, you know, then somehow you kind of feel that there is a connection. And what I'm trying to say is not that this is copyism. What it is, it's discourse. These people talk to each other. They knew each other. They would, what are you doing? And I'm thinking about this and that. And of course, you know, if you look in architecture, that is one bit you see here in this apartment house by Santelia. This is something that Auguste Perret did, which is in a way interesting as a precursor to the ideas of Corbusier of putting of allotting high-rise buildings around the town, right, as icons. I'll come to that. But this was thought as a part of a peace exhibition, I think. Let's see where, yeah, this had something to do with making a kind of, you could say, a first kind of idea of a United Nations. He, this was his idea, you see? He rounded that. It's actually something that Moscow picked up later after the Russian Revolution. It has these seven buildings of different use, and they also are kind of pinnacles in the city. And Corsier, I think, picked this up. His Ville Contemporaine, the city of today, Ville <laughs> Contemporaine, um, this is from 1922. They are based, of course, on his ideas of a functionalist city, the Ville Radieuse, as he called that. He did, I mean, it is, in a way, this model, I, I don't know if you know this, but it is, in some way, the basis of a later congress called the Congress International d'Architecture Moderne, SIAM, which was founded in Switzerland in 1928. But this thing, of course, had also some kind of human analogy because the, the things of the administration were at the head of the city. That was the brain. Then you had lungs that were the parks. Then you had guts that was the industry, the dirty industry, you know, that produced rubbish. And so, you know, but I, what one could say that this model was not very successful because it is in many cities, it is the root of dislocation rather than implementation and an, an urban life. But that is my personal view, so you might not agree at all. And he showed how this city would look like and how you could have a cup of coffee looking there. And it was green and it was air and it was light. It was considered to be much more healthy and so on. What, what, what we found in the 50s and 60s when we implemented this kind, of, this kind of architecture was, of course, that it was also very antisocial and it made ghettos and it made a lot of problems. But this we know from hindsight. So, and then, of course, Corbusier starts to make a comparison. He said, look at this Manhattan. This is completely crazy. I mean, it's much too dense. There is no light. This is rubbish. We have to do it. We have the high rise, yes, but we do it like that. And then he had some guys who really also took up St. Elia, had nothing to do with Kobe. This is Hilbersheimer in Berlin, making a Großstadt, the Hochhausstadt, a high rise city from 1924 to 1930. They knew each other, Kobe and, and uh, Hilbersheimer. 
And you see here also this integration, or the, here you have the separation, you have car traffic. Uh, if, if we think of Montevideo having this much car traffic, it would be nice, wouldn't it? But <laughs> there were just not so many cars, is what I'm trying to say. But then you have the segregation of traffic, the pedestrian thing is taking place here. This is for motorized traffic. Then look, this is what happens in airports these days. You have downstairs, you have the, the train arriving and so on. Yes, and I will come to the last part of what I have to say. Uh, Corbusier, of course, also invented, or let's say, yes, he invented a way of how to make people live together using the idea of an element, a spatial element, as if we didn't already hear about this. It's a, almost a bullseye idea in some way. And we know his pictures where he picks up some, some sort of elemental double height module and he puts it into a rack, which is the unité. I don't know if you know this photo. I don't think I have it here. But this is the basic idea of this, right? That these things are double height spaces. And he developed it. He was given a place in an exhibition uh, where he made a pavilion, which he called Le Pavillon d'Esprit Nouveau, a pavilion of a new spirit in, I think, 1925, okay. And um, there he developed, actually, this double height space, all these things, and this you can see in, in, in that museum, which I talked about, whose name I forgot, unfortunately. Uh, but um, this idea of how, that's how you should live, comes from, from this Esprit Nouveau pavilion, because you can see this is the inside, and um, it had these basic elements of the double height space in parts, of the sort of, you know, the sort of one up. Yeah, it had the integration into nature and so on. Now, here he also goes back to a Parisian tradition, I think where he says, this is um, le plan voisin. Now, in English, this means the plan of your neighbors. A voisin is a neighbor. And uh, this is rather strange, because what he does is he says the same thing again. He says, this Paris is just loud, it's filthy, it's unhealthy. We need to change it, so let's take it off. For another reason, then Haussmann, it was not military reason, but he was more interested, you know, his new way of making urbanism, um, well, it necessitated, it never got done, it necessitated that he goes to Paris and takes sort of one half off. And interestingly, I think this location is actually today behind um, it's La Défense. So La Défense, in a way, is the replacement of much later, of Corbusier's idea of a, of a plan voisin. Yes, and um, he made, you see, the new center of Paris. So again, you have Ile de France, you have the Eiffel Tower, but here comes Corbusier, right? And there it is. This is this Ville Radieuse, what I talked about before. You have at the head the brain, that's the administration. You have the housing units. You have green in between, a lot of green in between. You have the guts of production down here. This is, you can read, uh, there's a book about biological analogies and other analogies, which is interesting. How, you know, and then here, of course, he is not tired to say, Listen, if we do what I think, namely this, and we, we go up high, we will avoid this nonsense here. This is terrible, right? The small scale. I don't like that. This should go away. Or the block, like in New York. What does he have here? Buenos, Buenos Aires, huh? He, also the block. He said it should be changed. You should take it off. And he makes these further images of how he imagined that would look like. And again, you can see, he's taking off half of Paris. 
1933, how to live in this green city. And you will find many ideas that came back or became reality, really. This is a plan for Anvers and Antwerpen in Belgium. Those are the founders of the Siam who canonized, who kind of made a manifesto of these beliefs of Le Corbusier. In 1939, they wrote the Siam uh, Charter according for new urbanistic uh, approaches to, to big city, modern cities. And um, you have Siegfried Gideon here. Uh, most of the other guys don't know. But, the, you know, they were from Sweden, they were from Germany, they were from everywhere. They, that went on successfully until about 1960, when another team came, the Team 10, a lot of Dutch people in it, who said these ideas of See, I'm there are ridiculous. We have to change that. We have to go back to the small grain and look at our heritage. Now, to read me correct, I have to be honest, I am a pupil of Aldo Rossi in Zurich. And he influenced me a lot. Because Aldo Rossi was the first one after the war who in 1966 published the book Storia della Città, which I recommend you as students to read it, who was saying, you can't kill a city. You cannot just come and say, okay, you know what, goodbye. That doesn't work. Because a city is something, it's a human work, which is very complex, and which is, and those people that are interested in archaeology know this, you can take layers of time. And he argued that the city has a permanence because, and of course he was Italian, so his um, idea of this permanence was very old, because you can see until today in the landscape of Italy, you can see the old Roman roads. They, you can use them today with cars and so on, but the infrastructure, the plan, the grid even, they were on a grid, that stayed, that doesn't go away. Which in some way means you should use what your forefathers made, you can translate it into your time, but you should not go and destroy it and just get rid of it. That was Rossi. And the way he explained the city was that he said the city is really made up of types, building types. This is interesting, right? That you have, like the blocks is a sort of very typical building block, a high-rise building, and so on. And they, but they, to his mind, made up only the kind of, like, say, um, basic layer of the city. What made the city stick out are its monuments. Now, monuments, you should not confuse with the idea of monumentalism. It's not that. The monument is a thing in a city. It can be very small, actually that has something to do with the characteristics and the history of that city. It can be a church, can be anything, it can be your McDonald's down the, you know, down the coastal way here, which is a building from the 1930s. And in some way, you see, um, probably what the city here did is to say to McDonald's, well, if you want to sell your stuff, you have to go into that building where you can't touch anything. You can do inside what you like, but we will not let you just take it off. And um, I was just talking with, um, with your dean about, um, you know, with Gaston, about, you know, what is this with um, this little old shipyard that everybody has been talking about in the past? Uh, here, on the, uh, also on the coastal way, right across, I think, from the American embassy, the old one and the German one. What are we going to do with this? I think that's an interesting spot. For instance, you, you cannot just say, we take it off, we make something, boom, bam, bam, you know, this sort of investor architecture kind of, uh, yeah. The emphasis is on investing, 
and not on architecture. If you live in a city like Frankfurt, you will see the same thing. Frankfurt today has a nickname. It's called Bankfurt because it has 300 banks from all over Europe put into a kind of city center with high rises. It looks very American. And it completely changed its, its face, but it kept also its historic parts. So this would have been actually nice to show you because it's about you know, where I live. But um, what I'm trying to say is that if you have certain ideas in your mind, you can have a kind of instrumentarium. You have some instruments, mental instrument, to tackle a question anywhere. You can go to Montevideo, and you look at this, and you say, aha, yeah, OK, I understand. It's this, this, and this, and this. Aha, this is important. That's a, that's a monument. That's a monument of the city. In the sense of Alros, it, you could say that this old shipyard you know, with its tower and the clock can be seen as something like that, something that you shouldn't just throw away. So um, yeah, that's where I think I should end. Uh, because I think I've done, you know, I've done a big perspective. It was rather a bit much, but um, with some hope, I'll just be back. So thank you very much.